Bibles tonight to Romans chapter 14, verses 17 through 19. Uh, we're going to pick up a new lesson, lesson number eight, entitled Righteousness, Peace, and Joy. And that's what we should be experiencing uh, individually as Christians as well as a church collectively. We should be experiencing the righteousness that comes of the relationship with Christ, which results in peace with God, and also an overflow of joy. That should be what the Christian uh, believer should be experiencing as well as the Christian church. That's what we should be experiencing together when we come together as a body of believers. We want to sing a familiar song that we know, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, this peace that I have, this love that I have, the world didn't give it and the world didn't take it away. And so it's going to kind of be with our theme tonight, uh, Romans chapter 14, Verses 17 through 19, it's lesson number eight, entitled Righteousness, Peace, and Joy. And so we want to sing a portion of this joy that I have, and then we'll come back with a brief prayer, and then we'll um, look into God's word from Romans chapter 14 tonight. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. This peace that I have. The world didn't give it to me. Help me say, this peace that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, this peace that I have, the world didn't give it to me. You know the world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. This love that I have. The world didn't give it to me. Help me say, this love that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, this love that I have, the world didn't give it to me. You know the world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Come on now. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. You know the world didn't give it. The world can't take it. The world didn't give it. The world can't take it. The world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. Amen. This joy, this peace, and this love, the world didn't give it. It came from God. Father, we come, we thank you tonight yes, thank you, Jesus. for righteousness, peace, and joy, yes. which are products of the Holy Spirit when we live in union with Jesus Christ. And so we thank you, Lord God, that we have something that the world cannot take away. Jesus promised us his peace. He said, my peace, I leave with you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And so we thank you, God, for righteousness, which comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. We are made right with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you that we have peace with God also. Yes, Lord. Um, we are no longer enemies of God, but we are children of God. And then, God, we thank you for the joy that we have. Thank you, Lord God, that uh, you promised to fill our, our lives with joy. And so we thank you for uh, the byproducts of the Holy Spirit, righteousness, peace, and joy. Father, we pray that you would forgive our transgressions and sins tonight also, Lord God. And we thank you that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous, even our sins are covered 
under the blood of Jesus. And so we thank you, Father. We ask also, Lord, that you would be with us tonight. Lord, if there's anybody here that's not feeling well, uh, feel like they can't go on, we ask that you would give them strength tonight, Lord, above their own human strength. Give them what you gave Paul, that in his weakness, your strength is made perfect. And so, God, we pray for strength tonight for the believers. Uh, we also pray, Lord, that you would bless the saints of God who may be on their way, asking that you would give them traveling mercies and grace. And for those that are working tonight, Lord God, we pray that you would help them to um, work as unto the Lord and not for me, knowing that from the Lord they shall receive the reward of the inheritance. And so, God, we pray that you would bless those who are watching tonight by means of social media. We pray, God, that through this study, they will have a deeper understanding of who Jesus is and who they are because of what he's done on their behalf. We pray for the salvation of souls tonight. Someone who will be watching tonight who may not understand what Christianity is all about. It's about a relationship with God through his son who came into the world to save us from our sins by going to the cross, paying the price that we owe for sin and being raised from the dead three days later. He lives and he sits at the right hand of God. And one day he's coming back to receive the church unto himself. Even the dead in Christ will rise when he comes. And then we'll all be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And we'll always be with the Lord. Wherefore, we are to encourage one another with these words. And so we thank you uh, for your word tonight that gives us assurance of our future. We ask that you would be with us right now, Lord, in the study of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Again, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Again, we want to pick back up with a new lesson from Romans chapter 14, verse 17 through 19. And the lesson is entitled Righteousness, Peace, and Joy. Now, the main ideal of this lesson is to live the way God ordained you Amen. to live. You still won't live the perfect life, but there will be a daily desire to please God in who you are and how you live. And so we are to live the way that God has ordained for us to live. And even while we live in that way, we still won't be perfect. But our daily desire is to please God in all that we do. Then the question to explore in this lesson is, how can I have the peace of God when my entire world is falling apart? You know, um, Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulations, right? Mm -hmm. So how can we have um, peace? How can we experience the peace of God when our world is falling apart? Anybody care to give an answer? How can you personally speak? And how can you still experience God's peace even when your world is falling apart? You got to struggle through that, uh Try to keep your eyes focused on God. Yes, ma'am. Through the storm, to get through the storm. The only way you're going to get through the storm is to focus more and keep praying more and uh, believing that you're going to get through it instead of uh, doubting it. Okay. See, a lot of times we get into a storm when we start, we get weakened, you know, weaken us, and uh, we can't stay focused, but we have to learn to stay strong and stay focused in God. Oh, okay. Sister Sivan, I think you stand focused. You're focusing on his promises. Okay. His word. Yeah. So he has said he will never leave us nor forsake us. Okay. And sometimes we just got to be still. You know? That's right. That God is God. Watch him do what he do. That's right. So I agree with Sister. Focus. focus stay focused. Him. And stay focused on what he has promised in his words. Yes, sir. All right, then. And so the teaching aim is to encourage adults to realize that peace is not the absence of problems, but tranquility in the midst of those problems. I thought about this, and you can turn with me uh, for this. Uh, turn to Mark chapter 4. So it's to encourage your dust to realize that peace is not the absence of problems, but tranquility 
in the midst of those problems. And let's turn to Mark chapter four, and we'll discover in this story, remember Jesus um, is on the boat with his disciples and a great storm arose on the Sea of Galilee. But Jesus had peace. He had tranquility in the midst of that, all of that chaos. Have y'all ever seen people when something happens around them, some folks just go crazy. They start running, screaming, they panic, some faint. Some of them just don't know what to do, so they just stand still. <laughs> and then there are just some people who are so calm, so, okay, y'all calm down, calm down. We're going to make it through. It's going to be all right. Follow me right behind me. Please come right behind me. Right There are some people who know how they've been trained that way or they just have a piece about a situation to where they can analyze a situation and say, okay, what's the best plan? And then there are some people who just lose it. I mean, we have to ask ourselves, which one of those people am I? Uh, now, it's, I think it all depends on the situation. Uh, most of us, when we see a dog running after us, we go crazy, you know, right? We're jumping over cars, flipping over fences, and the dog might be about only six inches off the ground, <laughs> one of them ankle biters, and we just go crazy, right? Yes. Now, and some of us handle that situation pretty good. Oh, get away with little dog. But if it's a bear, then that's a different story, right? Uh, when you have a grizzly bear coming at you, you know, your adrenaline um, wants to kick in and you want to flee. But we've been told that if you've been attacked by a bear, if he's threatening you, you are to make yourself big. You're not to run. You're supposed to start making yourself big. Okay. You know, you start flailing around, making yourself bigger than you are. And sometimes he will calm down. He'll go the other way because well, he sees out. you as a threat. I had to find out from somebody. And so, but you don't run because if right. you run, you are dead meat. <laughs> and so let's take a look at a situation because the point we're trying to make is that we ought to encourage you as Christian or does to realize that peace is not the absence of problems but tranquility in the midst of those problems. Mark chapter four, and we'll read verses 35 through 41. Who uh, would like to read that for us? Mark chapter four, verses 35 through 41. And we'll see how Jesus responds versus how his uh, disciples respond to the same situation. Uh, and the same day when the even was gone, in was gone, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had seen, sent away the multitude, they looked, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the way beat into the ship, so that it was not full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillar, and they awaked, awaked him and said unto him, Master, care, care is there not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. Yes, yes. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is that ye have no faith? Keep going. And they feared except separately, secretly, and said to to another, what matter of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Okay. Yes, so here's a situation. Yes, ma'am. Now, what, what is the situation that Sylvia just read? It's a storm. A storm, right? Storms can be so unpredictable, right? Yes. Uh, you got lightning, you got hail, you got wind, you got rain. Um, so storms are very unpredictable. Now, keep in mind that most of these men 
or fishermen. So they done dealt with storms before, yes, especially out on the Sea of Galilee. Um, but sometimes just because you are aware of things that happens around you all the time, it doesn't mean that you're going to respond the same way all the time. So the situation is a storm, right? And this storm is so violent that the, uh, it begins to fill up the little boat that they're on. But Jesus had said a word before they got in the storm. And what was the word that he, he spoke to them uh, before they, the storm occurred? Let us cross to the other side, right? Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, they're, they're in the will of God because they're with Jesus. So they're in the will of God. Just because you're in the will of God don't mean that you won't have no storms. Yes, mm -hmm. But it's good to have Jesus on board in the midst of your storm. Amen. And so while they are in the will of God, obeying what Christ has commanded them to do, he said, let us get into the boat and go to the other side. That was the destination. And then as soon as they get to the other side, they're going to meet a demon-possessed man who's naked and running in the graveyard, right? And so Jesus has uh, just sent the crowd away from this what day of teaching. Uh, they're going over to the other side of the, of the uh, sea, and then they get caught up in this storm. Now, Jesus had been teaching all day, so he's tired. You know, he's God and he's man. Uh, and so Jesus decides to take a nap. Uh, he's on the hinder uh, part of the boat and he has him a pillow and he's taking a nap. Yeah. And meanwhile, while he's sleeping, um, this great storm arose and, and the, the disciples become very afraid, much afraid because the water was filling the boat. Keep in mind that <clears throat> they are afraid that they're going to die. <clears throat> And Jesus is sleeping. <laughs> it, it's just two different contrasts, right? One person responds, well, I can go to sleep in a storm. You know, old folks had it bad saying, y'all sit down and be quiet. God is doing his work, right? <laughs> you couldn't watch no TV. You couldn't move. You know, but kids, they, they, they want to play. We don't see no threat. We in the house, right? <laughs> yep. But old folks who are afraid, they feel like everything that this storm could bring, could happen, is going to happen. Y'all sit down and be still. Jesus is sleeping. The disciples are fearful. And in their fear of drowning, they awake Jesus. And he gets up and just speaks to the storm that they're afraid of. Peace, be still. Be muzzled. <laughs> when? Shut your mouth, right? Mm -hmm. And then there was a great calm. Just as soon as it happened, it was over. Now, some storms last longer than others. Y'all know that, don't you? It's kind of like tornadoes. Tornadoes may touch the ground for about 30 seconds and do a lot of damage. Yes, as soon as they come, they're over just like that. But a lot of damage is done. But in this case, no damage was done. No life was lost. Jesus speaks to the winds and to the waves. In other words, he's in control of the universe mm -hmm. because he is the creator of the ends of the earth. And so they have to obey him. And so he, he speaks a word of peace be still. And the scripture says, and there was a great calm. Now the attention is not on the storm, it's on Jesus. They said, who can this man be that even the winds and the waves obey him? Their fear now changes. They're no longer afraid of the storm. They have a great reverence for Jesus who is able to calm the storms. And I think that's a lesson there that we should be able to go to Jesus when the storms of life are raging because we know that he can speak to the storms and have them to be muzzled. And so that's a life lesson right there. Uh, old, old folks say that'll preach there. <laughs> that'll preach all, all by itself. Right. Uh, Pastor Young wrote a song and he said, there's a message from the Lord when you are in a storm. Don't worry about the storm. The storm will pass away. Don't worry about the storm. Things will work 
out fine. Don't worry about the storm. The storm will pass away. And so Jesus asked them, why were you so afraid? Is it because you had no faith? And I think that's what it is sometimes when God allows storms to happen. He's actually just testing our faith. It was just a test. You know, in Tyler, right around the beginning of the month, or maybe sometime in the middle of the month, the sirens go off. It's in the it's the first of the month. Now go ahead. I said the first of the third. Okay. And so the emergency sirens in Tyler go off. And all they're doing is testing them. They said, This is a test. This is only a test. <laughs> if if this was not a test, you need to uh, you know, turn into your uh, your local radio station for further instructions. This is only a test. Right? Yes. And that, that sound goes on for yes, about sir. 30 seconds to a minute. Then it just dies down. Yes. But they told you this is only a test. <laughs> well, tests and trials in life will come. Jesus said in the world, you have tests. But be of good cheer when you're in the middle of your test. I've overcome the world. He overcame the storm. He spoke to the storm. And so from this, we ought to learn that peace is not the absence of problems, but tranquility in the midst of your problems. Yes, because while we have someone greater than the storms or the trials of life that we can go to in the midst of the storm. I thought about Pastor uh, Genesis 22. Okay. Abraham being tested. The great nation is supposed to have his son, but he was told to take his boy. Hmm. In, in chapter 22, 5, Abraham says, Stay here with the donkey, he told his servants. The boy and I will travel a little bit further. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. Okay. But the verses prior to that, verse 1 says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. That's right. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, Here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, mm. and go to the land. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. And that's what he's supposed to do. But Abraham said in verse 5, me and the boy will return. Okay. Great faith. Mm -hmm. Great faith. Now, the point Sister Moore brings out that mm. also kind of stuck with me. He said, the boy that you love. He ain't got but one. Right. Well, no, he, no, I'll take that back. He got two. He got Ishmael. But the promise is through Isaac, right? Mm -hmm. God tests us sometime through the things we love. Ooh, now, the things true. that you hate ain't no test to you. You, you. you can give up stuff you hate, right? You know, <laughs> if you don't like ice cream, it ain't no test to give it up. But if you like chocolate pie and you ooh, chocolate pie right <laughs> well god wouldn't ask you to give up something that you don't like sometimes god allows you to be tested with something that you love more than him mm. right when when um when peter um remember after jesus was raised from the dead this is in john chapter 21 peter says i'm going fishing and the rest of them saying i'm going with you and they fished and caught nothing all night, right? And then P Jesus shows up and says, Children, have you caught anything? Cast your what nets on the right side and you'll catch. And they caught 153 fish. Mm -hmm. And John said, It's the Lord. And Peter shan't swam ashore. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Yes. See, God tests <laughs> us with things that we know that we are attracted to, that, we, that has our attention, that has our devotion. Do you love me more than these? And, and, and many commentators have suggested that these may refer to the other disciples because Peter says, I will never forsake you or deny you, even though if these guys leave you. Or it may refer to these fish because Peter was a fisherman. He made his living by fishing. 
So do you love me more than these? And uh, and so God tests us in the areas that sometimes have we have that I have strongholds on our lives. Do you love me more than this job? More than these children? More than that man? More than that woman? More than that money? Right? And so he tests our loyalty to him because we are to have no other gods before him. And so great example. God used uh, in Genesis 22, Sister Moore alluded to that God had promised that he would through Abraham and his, his son Isaac, he would make a great nation. And now God is testing Abraham's faith to see if he's going to obey him and even sacrifice his son, which God really does not approve of. God never approved of human sacrifice. So it was a test. Now the Canaanites and, and uh, all of them, they, they, they sacrifice their children to their gods, but God never required a human sacrifice to offer up as an appeasement for our sins. And so let's turn back to um, Romans chapter uh, 14, and I'll read some of the um, background to get us um, started, and then we'll see how far we can go. In Romans chapter 14, Paul outlines a problem in the church at Rome. Houston, we have a problem. And the problem is in the church at Rome. So it's, it's spe specifically written to the church in Rome. Now, Paul didn't establish the church in Rome. Paul had never been to Rome. He has never met the Christians in Rome. But he's writing to encourage them. And he also has a desire to come and see them someday. And so there's a problem in the church at Rome. And the problem is this. Conflict arose between Christian Jews and Christian Gentiles. Jews held tight to ancient rites of Sabbath. In other words, they worship on the Sabbath, which is what Saturday so even though they're Christians, they're still holding on to their Sabbath traditions. Mm -hmm. So Jew, Jews held tight to ancient rites of Sabbath. Not only that, but they held tight to dietary laws related to daily meals. Now, Jews did not eat pork according to the Levitical law. They didn't eat pork. Uh, and so they held on to their dietary laws. Remember that when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was taken into Babylonian captivity and they and the, the king, King Nebuchadnezzar says, I want you guys to eat the finest that Babylon offers. Drink my wine, eat my delicacies, eat my chitlins, my hawk moths, my ribs, um, bacon. You, you can have it all. But the scripture says, but Daniel desired that he not defile himself from eating from the king's food. So they held strictly to their Jewish um, dietary restrictions, even when they was in a foreign land, because they saw that in obedience to God's law. So the Christian Jews, they were holding tight to their Sabbath uh, traditions. They were holding tight to their dietary laws related to daily meals and Jewish customs based on the Torah. Now the Torah are the five first books of the Old Testament. You got what Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's referring to the law, the Torah. And so uh, the Jewish customs based on the Torah and the covenant, they mix this with their what? practice of Christianity. So even though they were Christians, they still held on to their Jewish customs and teachings that they were taught before they became Christians. More specifically, Jews refused to eat meat unless it was kosher. In Rome, the market known as the Agora had a section known as the meat market, uh, which is the word Masellum, where kosher meat could be purchased. 
So they didn't eat any swine or anything of that. They, you know, even when you go to a, a Muslim country today, you don't find them eating uh, pork. When I went to Turkey, we ate beef. Uh, they don't serve pork. That's a that's a um, kind of like blasphemy to them. You know, you going over there want to share pork with them. It's against their religious convictions. So you got to know the customs of where you're going so you don't offend people. And if you offend people, you can find yourself in jail or in, you know, dead in a... Yeah, so you have to be careful. You have to know the customs of another country before you go. You have to do your homework. So that's the Jews. The Jews are now Christians. They've accepted Christ, but they're holding on they're holding fast to their Jewish traditions. Mm -hmm. Now the Gentiles, which are non-Jewish people, which includes the Romans, knew nothing of these special diets. They didn't know nothing about kosher meat. They didn't know nothing about don't eat swine. They didn't know anything about keeping the Sabbath. They didn't know anything about other Jewish customs. In fact, the Gentiles felt such ideals were strange. A Gentile ate all kinds of meat and did not participate in any kind of holiday except Roman holidays, which were what fun-filled days of sport, drink, and festivities. And so you got these two customs. You got these two um, people who come from different backgrounds. Now they're in the church. You got Jews, you got Romans. They come from different backgrounds. I thought about this. When, when two people get married, two families get married. And, and what happens, all your upbringing that your mom and your dad and your big mom and grandpa taught you, you bring to your marriage. Well, your wife over here on the other hand or your husband on the other hand, they may have different customs. They may have different beliefs. And you now have to mesh all that together in a marriage, right? That's what happened when Jesus uh, went to the cross and died for Jews and Gentiles. He created one new family. That's the family of God. And now the Jews bring their traditions into the church. The Gentiles who have no laws, no dietary restrictions, they, they said, well, man, y'all y'all are tripping. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with eating pork and chitlins and hot dogs. and What are y'all, man, What y'all don't know what y'all missing. <laughs> and so you can eat whatever you want now. Because that's what the Bible says. Even in the book of Genesis, after the flood, God says, see, I have provided all, all food for you to eat now, right? Mm -hmm. And so there, you know, before the flood, the people were die, what'd you call it? Uh, they were vegetarians. Adam and Eve ate fruits and vegetables. They didn't eat meat. But after the flood, when Noah and his sons got off the boat, God said, see, I've given you all the animals to eat, right? Certain animals. Only thing you can not to do is to drink the blood of that animal because life is in the blood, right? And so God has given us whatever we want to eat now but you need to eat it in moderation. You need to be careful what you eat because it don't, don't want to cause you health problems. Uh, and so with liberty comes responsibility. And so when me and my wife got married, I had the more Dewberry Williams background coming into the marriage. She had what the um, Coopers and the Allens coming into the marriage. And now we are one in Christ and then we got all these different customs. I'm sh pretty sure they taught her certain things about life. My parents taught me something about life. And maybe what they taught me was different from what her parents taught her. But if you want your marriage to work, you have to compromise. You have to meet in the middle and say, let's do what's best for us. When it comes to raising our kids, when it comes to what's spending our money, some folks didn't have a clue about money because they never saw their parents work a budget. They spent every dime they had or they didn't have no dime to spend because every dime went on what? Bills and, and trying to take care of families. 
And so keep that in mind. You got Jews who are Christians. You have Romans, Gentiles who are now Christians. And now they're in the same church. And now a problem arises because of their different customs or traditions. And one of them was eating of meat. Now let's, for the background, let's go to um, Romans 14 to set the stage. They're both Christians, Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians. They're in the same body of Christ. And they're trying to hold on to the old way of life. Let's look at Romans 14. Welcome the person who is weak in faith. But do not argue with him about his personal opinions. Y'all see it? So Paul is setting the stage. He's, in other words, he said, accept your brothers and sisters as they are with their customs, with their beliefs. Welcome the person who is weak in faith, but do not argue with him about his personal opinions or we could say convictions. And we can go, we can, we can say right here, okay. I, I, mean, I brought up a subject Sunday about music, didn't I? There are some Christians and you have the liberty to listen to Beyonce to ZZ Hill and to Bobby Bland and Tyrone Davis or whoever, Usher, uh, whoever else is out there, Rockwall or Rockwell. <laughs> I don't know who's out there. And then we, sometimes when my wife and I, we turn on a TV show like, who in the world is that, right? Because we don't keep up with the latest secular music and songs. And... Uh, and so, but a lot of Christians still listen to secular music. But the scripture says, whatever you do in word or in deed, do it all for the glory of God. My, my, my thing is, make sure what you're listening to, what you're watching, don't draw you away from God. Right? So the scripture says, be careful how you live. Live wise and not as fools because the days are evil. You need to redeem the times, right? And so Paul is saying here, welcome the person or welcome the brother or sister who is weak in faith, but do not argue with him about his personal opinion. One person's faith allows him to eat anything, but the person who is weak in the faith eats only vegetables. So that's the issue at hand. Some Jewish Christians saying we're not supposed to eat that meat offered up at the marketplace unless it's kosher, unless it's beef. But on the other hand, the Gentiles said, no, we can eat anything. We don't have, have to have no dietary restrictions. Notice what he said, because I'm reading from the Good News Bible, so it may sound totally different from what you're reading. He, he says in verse 2, one person's fate allows him to eat anything. But the person who is weak in the faith eats only vegetables. Verse 3, the person who will eat anything is not to despise the one who doesn't. While the one who eats only vegetable is not to pass judgment on the one who will eat anything. For God has accepted him. In other words, God has accepted both. If you're a vegetarian, you're a vegetarian to the glory of God. If you're a meat eater, you're a meat eater to the glory of God. God accepts you whether you're either or, right? Look at verse 4. Who are you to judge the servant of someone else? It is his own master, that is God, who will decide whether he succeeds or fail. And he will succeed because the Lord is able to make him succeed. Verse 5. One person thinks that a certain day, so now we leave the eating of eating meat or just eating vegetables. And then we go to days, right? Because the Jews held fast to certain feast days. Mm -hmm. One person thinks that a certain day is more important than other days, while someone else thinks that all days are the same. Each one should firmly make up his own mind. Whoever thinks highly of a certain day does so in honor of the Lord. 
whoever will eat anything does so in honor of the Lord, because he gives thanks to God for the food. Whoever refuses to eat certain things does so in honor of the Lord, and he gives thanks to God. None of us lives for himself only. None of us dies to himself only. In other words, we are interconnected in the body of Christ. If we live, it is for the Lord that we live. And if we die, it is for the Lord that we die. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For Christ died and rose to life in order to be the Lord of the living and of the dead. You then, who eat only vegetables, why do you pass judgment on your brother? And you who eat anything, why do you despise your brother? All of us will stand before God to be judged by him. For the scripture says, as surely as I am the living God, says the Lord, every knee will kneel before me and everyone will confess that I am God. Every one of us then will have to give an account of himself to God. <clears throat> Verse 13, so then let us stop judging one another. Instead, you should decide never to do anything that would make your brother stumble or fall into sin. My union with the Lord Jesus makes me certain that no food is of itself ritually unclean. But if a person believes that some food is unclean, then it becomes unclean for him. If you hurt your brother because of something you eat, then you are no longer acting from love. Do not let the food that you eat ruin the person for whom Christ died. Do not let what you regard as good get a bad name. In other words, don't let your what good be spoken evil of, right? In other words, we're going to have differences, we're going to have preferences that are different from one another. But he says, don't let that split you up. Don't let that cause division among you. Christ died for all of us. And whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. He says, so put, throw out the welcome mat to your Christians and brothers and stop um, arguing about Days stop arguing about whether it's okay to eat meats, whether it's okay to just eat vegetables. It says here, at the heart of the church's conflict were the strong Gentile Christians and the weak Jewish Christians. Spiritually, Paul emphasizes not rites, not rituals, not customs, related to race or background, but Christian virtue. Ideally, a focus on Christ that we would bear fruit, righteousness, peace, and joy. In general, the book of Romans addresses the power of the gospel for all, peace, and an appeal to church unity. Paul communicates that he is under obligation to both Jews and Gentiles, the wise and the unwise to help them understand and believe the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. He does not want a divided church marked off by the strong and the weak, but a unified church at peace with Christ and at peace with each other. How did Paul aim to achieve unity and peace in the church at Rome? And so that's what we want to continue to look at in other words, we are to throw out the welcome mat uh, to all Christians, whether they, um, some, some people say, well, we shouldn't dance. And some Christians say, well, I don't see no, nothing wrong with dancing. I'm not dirty dancing. I'm not doing the hoochie coochie. I'm not dropping it like it's hot. <laughs> right? Uh, I'm not twerking. I'm not doing none of that stuff. Right? I'm just out there having fun on the dance floor. Right? And, but if it causes another brother or sister to stumble, don't do it in their presence. And that's the point, because we want to operate in love. Now, if you like drinking, 
don't invite me over to your drinking party. You know, offer me a soda pop. But I'm not going to say you can't drink. You can do whatever you want to do. You're a grown person. That's right, bro. But don't offer me a drink. Uh, because one of the qualifications for a man who desires to be a bishop or a preacher that he must not desire strong drink or wine. And we get it all the time. Watch this, watch this. Well, here comes the preacher. Hey, preacher, you want to cook 45? <laughs> right? We get that. We know that's coming. <laughs> you want to hit this pastor? <laughs> no, I don't want to. I want to hit you. <laughs> but no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the test, right? And some preachers say, yeah, let me hit it. They, oh, the preacher hit it. Look at him. Right? <laughs> Right? I mean, so he has that. He has that. But will he cause another person to stumble? He might. And so we have to be consciously aware that I can do that. But if it causes you to stumble, I'm going to refrain from doing that. Right? And so that's the point that Paul is trying to let the Gentile Christians know, let the what Jewish Christians know, hey, guys, um, you can do whatever you want to do, but if it causes another brother or sister to stumble, don't do that. Uh, Romans 14, 17, we'll, we'll start and see how far we can go. Since we've already given the background about not judging your brother or sister when it comes to uh, days, when it comes to food. He goes on to say in verse 17 of Romans 14, for God's kingdom is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy, which the Holy Spirit gives. Y'all see that? So it's not a matter of eating and drinking and what you, what if, you know, I always say this thing, and I say it out of fun. I say, as, um, I say this whole thing about, I don't, what, Chew, what is it? I don't drink, I don't chew, and I don't date girls that do. Yeah, y'all know I <laughs> y'all know that I say that out of fun, right? And so, oh, he don't, oh, he think he too good. <laughs> no, I'm just saying it out of fun. And there are some Christians who smoke, who drink, and who chew. And they date guys and girls that do, right? And so you have the liberty to smoke and drink and chew. You do. That's your Christian liberty. And so those things won't keep us out of hell. Smoking and drinking and chewing won't keep folks out of hell. Unbelief in the gospel that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. If you don't believe that, that's going to keep you out of hell. Yes, right? Yes, now, what the other things might do is take a, a whole lot of money out of your pocket and, yes, and deteriorate your health. Yes, yes. Those things might do that. Uh, but it's not a sin to 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 um to chew and to dip and to drink, but you're to drink in moderation, right? Uh, do not get drunk with wine, which is, which is excess, but rather be filled with the Holy Ghost. So if it causes me to lose my witness, I shouldn't do it, right? And so Paul is appealing. The two key ideas here in Romans 14, verse 17. First, he says we are to welcome each other. That's why he says in Romans 14, welcome the person who is weak in faith, but do not argue with him or her about his or her personal opinions or convictions. We all have personal convictions of what we won't do, mm -hmm. right? Oh, yes. Um, I, I just won't buy a lottery ticket. I, I just won't go down to the uh, line. I just won't go uh, to the casinos. I just won't do that. That's my personal conviction. Many Christians do. I'm not telling them they ain't Christian because they go to the casinos and be because they drink. You can be a Christian and do all those things, right? So your salvation is not based on what, what you eat or drink. That's what he says in verse 17. Let's go back to it again. For God's kingdom, keep in mind, we're, we're in the kingdom of God. And how do we get in the kingdom of God? Yeah. 
by believing in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, right? Jesus' first message was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? So we get into repentance and belief in the gospel. But Paul is saying here to these Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians who are now in the church at Rome, can I tell y'all something? He says in verse 17, for God's kingdom is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy. So if you want to, um, if you want to please God, please God in the areas of what? Righteousness, peace, and joy that comes through living a life filled of the Holy Spirit. And so that's what he's um, sharing with them. Uh, Paul says, welcome each other, according to Romans 14, verse 1. In other words, throw out the welcome mat at church and open your arms to receive those different from you. Would you say that others in the congregation are different from you? Yes. <laughs> now, do we have... Yes. Now, do we have... <clears throat> let me say it this way. We tend to cater to people like us, not different from us, mm -hmm. right? So we find, we find ourselves drifting more toward people like us, but not different from us, even though they're Christians. But we drift toward people like us, people that we got things in common with. And so that's what happens sometimes in the church, though. And that started happening in the church in Corinth. They would come to the love feast, the agape feast. The poor Christian would come. Like I said, they probably brought Roman noodles. <laughs> and, the, and the rich Christian, you know, they had lobster <laughs> and steak. But when you come to church, you probably bring your lobster and steak to the same table that the Roman noodles are sitting on. But what was happening in the church in Corinth, the rich were eating over here, and they call it a love feast. Now, agape, which is love, they call it a love feast, but what no love. <laughs> they were singing the song over there, love don't live here anymore. <laughs> and they were coming to the love feast showing no love. Mm. And they were separating themselves. Paul says even some of them were bringing their liquors. <laughs> Sylvia loved that gin and juice, <laughs> right? She was bringing that to the love feast, right? She was getting crunk up in here, <laughs> right? And so, um, and some of them was actually getting drunk while observing the Lord's table. And Paul says, what? Don't you have houses to eat and drink and get drunk at? And you come up in here and you despise the body of Christ. They were divided. And the scripture says, and because of that, Paul says, and that's why some of you are sick. Some of you are weak. And God done struck some of y'all dead. And y'all call this the love feast. And if we would have a singer come into the love feast, it would be Tina Turner singing what love got to do with it, right? And that what was happening in the church in Corinth. That was happening now in the church at Rome. You had Jewish Christians holding on to their Jewish traditions. And you had the Gentile Christians who had no kosher law, who had no what uh, Ten Commandments to obey. And, but now they're all in the same church, sitting right, well, hopefully they sit beside each other. And I still find it, Strange that people don't mix and mingle when they come to church. They sit in the same spot every Sunday. Y'all remember before the uh, pandemic, we used to say, hey, go greet somebody that you hadn't seen all week. You can still do that without being told, mm -hmm. right? But some of us, most of us have the tendency of sitting in the same spot every Sunday. You say, well, I'm on duty, so I got to sit there. I understand that. I'm just saying that at some time you need to reach across the aisle and say, hey, how you doing? Uh, embracing that person that typically sits by themselves. Nobody ever goes to greet. We have to throw the welcome mat out when we come to church. 
we need to try to find a way to bridge the gap because we have different classes in the church. We have the poor, we have the middle class. Ain't nobody wrote a million dollar check, so uh, I don't think we got no billionaires up in the church, right? So we, financially speaking, we're pretty much all on the same scale. Yeah. Yeah. All of us is a paycheck away from poverty. <clears throat> and so if that's a reality, what's keeping us from reaching across the aisle from the brother and sister who don't look like us, don't dress like us, don't smell like us? We find it difficult. I'm being real. We have difficulty reaching out to people who don't look like us, talk like us, smell like us, dress like us. And they feel ostracized even at church. And that's what, sir, that's in every church. And, and, and what I always hear people say, and I'm getting ready to close. <laughs> I hear people say all the time that about some churches look at what you wear. <clears throat> now that may be true, and that might not be so true. <clears throat> right? I don't know, but some of us can use it as an excuse for not coming to church. Right? I don't have nothing to wear. So that means you <laughs> you go to Walmart buck naked? <laughs> you ain't got nothing to wear? When you go to CVS and Walgreens, you streaking up and down the road. Y'all see the point I'm making when people say, I don't have nothing to wear. It may not be what you want to wear, but you do have something to wear. And so we've been we've given ourselves excuses not to fellowship. I don't have nothing to wear. That church over there always looking at what folks got on. I don't know if that's true or not. But I know over here, ain't nobody coming in here with no big old hats on and um, silk suits. We, we, we so cool up in here, we got blue jeans on half time, t-shirts, right? We ain't looking at what you got on. We so glad that you're here. We so fear a number. We ain't gonna be putting up no dress code and say, as long as you don't come naked, as long as you don't come with your mini skirt on and I can't preach because I'm looking at you and the deacons like <laughs> they got cricks in their neck because they they can't pay attention to the preacher. I mean, we have to have some moderation. And the brothers can't come up here with muscle shirts <laughs> like they on Muscle Beach. <laughs> so we have to have some moderation about ourselves, right? Because we don't want to do anything that causes others to stumble, right? And so Paul is saying here that when you come together as a church, throw out the welcome mat. Throw out the welcome mat at church and open your arms to receive those different from you. We're going to... And, and, and we, we, if we just put that into practice Sunday, <laughs> the church would be a whole lot better. See, see, this is this is a point of the application. We come to church for um, to gain understanding of the scripture, but there ought to be some application that you leave here tonight. And the, the application is when you come to church Sunday. Go across the aisle and find somebody that you never say hi to, that you never hug. Because now you're putting the message into practice. Mm -hmm. Unless you're like Alvin Iverson, practice. Mm -hmm. Y'all remember that episode with mm -hmm. Alvin Iverson was missing practice. He's a professional <laughs> basketball player back in the day with uh, what the Philadelphia 76ers. Mm -hmm. And uh, his coach said he needs to come to practice. And he said, practice, mm -hmm. practice, <laughs> right? We need to practice what we hear in church. The Bible says, be not only hearers of the word, deceiving yourselves, but be doers. And so here's the application that we need to learn as we close tonight. Throw out the welcome mat at church and find somebody that you really don't go to on a given Sunday and say, hey, how you doing? 
If you feel comfortable enough, give them a hug. Give them a church hug. <laughs> All right. Because some of them like to squeeze you tight. <laughs> but the scripture says, greet one another with a holy kiss. But we don't even know how to do that no more. And so, but here's the challenge as we leave. Throw out the welcome mat at church. Find somebody that's not like you Sunday and go and greet them. And say, hey, how you doing? How was your week? And see how their response, but their eyes might become big as saucers. Like, you talking to me? Yeah, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine in you. And you'd be surprised. <clears throat> the conversation that may, that may start. Today, I was um, at Brooks' Brothers trying to get some gas for the van. And uh, a woman across the street, she recognized me. I didn't recognize her. She had a name tag on. Evidently, she was with one of the churches here in Jacksonville. She said, I need you to pray for me. I need, I'm about to face surgery. They won't let me off my job. Blah, 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 blah. Right? <clears throat> and I said, okay, since you brought it up, let's pray. Most people don't pray with you when you say, I need you to pray for me. So it just took the woman up by surprise. I said, okay, let us pray. And I prayed with her. Woman just crying. She didn't believe that I would, I was going to. It caught off guard because most Christians, you tell them, pray for me. Yeah. Paul was saying, finally, brother, pray for me because not everybody has faith. So you need to pray for the preacher because we, we deal with attitudes, with people who are unsaved, and we're the, their worst enemy. And all we're trying to do is love them into the kingdom. And so this woman just cried while I was praying for her because she probably thought he ain't going to pray for me. In other words, I threw out the welcome mat and I went across the aisle and I started praying for somebody who needed prayer. Do that Sunday and see what will happen. See the, what the end result would be when you reach across the aisle and do something unexpectedly and see how people will respond. We thank you for joining us tonight for this Tuesday night Bible study. We're going to pick up Lord's will next Tuesday night, Romans 14, 17 through 19, dealing with righteousness, peace, and joy. Uh, we also invite you to come and join us in Sunday school at 10 o'clock. Um, this um, coming Sunday at 11 a.m. will be a special service for our ushers. We want to show appreciation for them. Pastor uh, Derek, Derek uh, Sanders will be our guest speaker at 11. So we invite you to come and join us in that service at 11 a.m. Um, as we so show appreciation for the work that the ushers do here at the church. Uh, thank you for joining us and may the Lord richly bless you and keep you as our prayer.